Prayer, open and vindicated, taken from Romans 8, verse 26. Prayer at present I take to be a gift, ability, or spiritual faculty of exercising faith, love, reverence, fear, delight, and other graces in a way of vocal requests, supplications, and praises to God. And everything let your requests be made known to God, Philippians 4, verse 6. This gift and ability I affirm to be bestowed, and this work by virtue thereof to be wrought in us by the Holy Ghost and the accomplishment of the promise insisted on, so cry and Abba, Father, and them that do believe. And this is that which we are to give an account of, in which we shall assert nothing but what the Scripture plainly goes before us in, and what the experience of believers duly exercised in duties of obedience confirms. And in the issue of our endeavor, we shall leave it to the judgment of God and His church, whether they are ecstatical, call unaccountable raptures that we plead for, or a real gracious effect and work of the Holy Spirit of God. The first thing we ascribe to the Spirit in this is that He supplies and furnishes the mind with the due comprehension of the manner of prayer, or what ought, both in general as in to all our particular occasions, to be prayed for. Without this, I suppose it will be granted that no man can pray as he ought. For how can any man pray that knows not what to pray for? Where there is not a comprehension of this, the very nature and being of prayer is destroyed. And in this, the testimony of the Apostle is expressed, Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It is that expression only which I at present urge. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. This is generally supposed to be otherwise, namely that men know well enough what they ought to pray for, only they are wicked and careless and will not pray for what they know they ought so to do. I shall make no excuse or apology for the wickedness and carelessness of men, which without doubt are abominable. But yet I must abide by the truth asserted by the Apostle, which I shall further evidence immediately, namely that without the special aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit, no man knows what to pray for as he ought. But yet there is another relief in this matter, and so no need of any work of the Holy Ghost in it, and we shall be accounted impudent if we ascribe anything to him in which there is the least colorable pretense that it may be otherwise effected or provided for. So great an unwillingness is there to allow him either place, work, or office in the Christian religion, or the practice of it. Therefore it is pretended that although men do not of themselves know what to pray for, yet this defect may be supplied in a prescript form of words prepared on purpose to teach and confine men to what they are to pray for. We may therefore dismiss the Holy Spirit and his assistance as to this concern of prayer, for the due manner of it may be so set down and fixed on ink and paper that the meanest capacity cannot miss of his duty in it. This, therefore, is that which is to be tried in our ensuing discourse, namely that, whereas it is plainly affirmed that we know not of ourselves what we should pray for as we ought, which I judge to be universally true as to all persons as well as those who prescribe prayers as those to whom they are prescribed, and that the Holy Spirit helps and relieves us in this, whether we may or ought to relinquish and neglect his assistance, and so to rely only on such supplies as are invented or used to that end for which he has promised, that is plainly whether the word of God be to be trusted to in this manner or not. It is true that whatever we ought to pray for is declared in the scripture, yea, and some are early comprised in the Lord's prayer. But it is one thing to have what we ought to pray for in the book, another thing to have it in our minds and hearts without which it will never be to us the due manner of prayer. It is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth must speak in this manner, Matthew 12, verse 34. There is therefore in us a threefold defect with respect to the manner of prayer, which is supplied by the Holy Spirit, and can be so no other way nor by any other means, and in this he is to us a spirit of supplication according to the promise. 4. 1. We don't know what our wants are. Number two, we know not the plies of them that are expressed in the promises of God. And number three, we know not the end in which what we pray for is to be directed, which I add to the former. 
Without the knowledge and understanding of all these, no man can pray as he ought. And we can no way know them, but by the aid and assistance of the Spirit of grace. And if these things be manifest, it will be evident how in this first instance we are unable to pray by the Holy Ghost. First, our wants, as they are to be the manner of prayer, may be referred to three heads, and none of them of ourselves do we know are right, so as to make them the due subject of our supplications, and of some of them we know nothing at all. 1. The first consists in our outward straits, pressures, and difficulties, which we desire to be delivered from with all other temporal things in which we are concerned. In all things it should seem wondrously clear that of ourselves we know what to pray for, but the truth is, whatever our senses may be of them and our natural desires about them, yet how and when, under what conditions and limitations, with what frame of heart and spirit, with what submission to the pleasure of God they are to be made a manner of our prayers, we don't know. Therefore God calls the prayers of most of them a howling, and not a crying to him with the heart, Hosea 7 verse 14. There is indeed a voice of nature crying in its distress to the God of nature, but that is not the duty of evangelical prayer which we inquire after. And men oftentimes most miss it when they think themselves most ready and prepared. To know our temporal wants, so as to make them the manner of prayer according to the mind of God, requires more wisdom than of ourselves we are furnished with. For who knows what is good for man in his life all the days of his vain life which he spends as a shadow? Ecclesiastes 6.12 And oft times believers are never more at a loss in how to pray aright about temporal things. No man is in pain or distress or under any wants, whose continuance would be destructive to his being. But he may, yea, he ought to make deliverance from them the manner of his prayer. So in that case he knows in some measure or in general what he ought to pray for, without any peculiar spiritual illumination. But yet the circumstances of those things, and wherein their respects to the glory of God and the supreme end or chiefest good of the person's concern, stands with regard whereunto they can alone be made the manner of prayer acceptable to God in Christ, are that which of themselves they cannot understand, but have need of an interest in that promise made to the church that they shall all be taught of God, so much more in such things as belong only to the conveniences of this life, and in which no man of himself knows what is good for him or useful to him. Number two, we have internal needs that are discerned in the light of a natural conscience, such as the guilt of sin, in which that accuses sins against natural light and the plain outward letter of the law. These things we know somewhat of without any special aid of the Holy Spirit, Romans 2, verses 14 and 15, and desires of deliverance are inseparable from them. But we may observe here two things. First, that the knowledge which we have of these of ourselves is so dark and confused is that we are in no ways able by this to manage our wants and prayer aright to God. A natural conscience awakened and excited by afflictions or other providential visitations will discover itself in unfeigned and severe reflections of guilt upon the soul. But until the Holy Spirit convinces us of sin, all things are in such disorder and confusion in the mind that no man knows how to make his address to God about it in a due manner. And there is more required to treat aright with God about the guilt of sin than a mere sense of it. So far as men can proceed under that soul conduct and guidance, the heathens went in dealing with their supposed gods without a due respect to the propitiation made by the blood of Christ. Yea, prayer about the guilt of sin discerned in the light of a natural conscience is but an abomination. Besides, too, we all know how small a portion of the concern of believers lies in those things which fall under the light and determination of a natural conscience. For the things about which believers do and ought to treat principally and deal with God in their supplications are the inward spiritual frames and dispositions of their souls, with the actings of grace and son in them. Hereon David was not satisfied with the confession of his original and all known actual sin, Psalm 51, 1-5, nor yet with an acknowledgment that none knows his own wanderings, whence he desires cleansing from unknown sin, Psalm 19, verse 12. But also he begs of God to undertake the inward searching of his heart to find out what was amiss or not amiss 
in him. Psalm 139, 23, and 24 is knowing that God principally required truth in the inward parts. Psalm 51, 6, such as the carrying on of the work of sanctification in the whole spirit and soul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. The inward sanctification of all of our faculties is what we want and pray for. Supplies of grace from God to this purpose with a sense of the power, guilt, violence, and deceit of sin and its inward actings in the mind and affections with other things innumerable thereunto belonging, make up the principal manner of prayer as formally supplication. But to the manner of prayer, taken largely for the whole duty so called, everything in which we have intercourse with God and faith and love belongs. The acknowledgement of the whole mystery of his wisdom, grace, and love in Christ Jesus, with all the fruits, effects, and benefits which thence do we receive all the workings and actings of our souls towards him, with their faculties and affections. In brief, everything and every conception of our minds in which our spiritual access to the throne of grace consists, or which does belong to it, with all occasions and emergencies of spiritual life or in like manner comprised in this, and that we can have such an acquaintance with these things as to manage them acceptably in our supplications, without the grace of spiritual illumination from the Holy Ghost, few are so ignorant or profane as to assert. Some, I confess, seem to be strangers to these things, which yet renders them not of the less weight or moment. But hence it comes to pass that the prayers of believers about them, especially their confessions of what sense they have of the power and guilt of the inward actings of sin, have been by some exceedingly traduced and reproached, for whereas they cannot out of their ignorance understand such things, out of their pride heightened by sensuality of life, they despise and contemn them. The manner of prayer may be considered with respect to the promises of God. These are the measure of prayer and contain the manner of it. It's all that he has promised and nothing else we are to pray for. For the secret things that belong to the Lord our God are to him alone, but the declaration of his will and grace belong to us and is our rule. Therefore, there is nothing that we really do or may stand in need of, but God has promised a supply of it, in such a way, and under such limitations as may make it good and useful to us. And there is nothing that God has promised, but we stand in need of, or some way or other concerned in as members of the mystical body of Christ, that is prepared and proposed in the promises of God. For how should we, seeing we are to pray for all that God has promised, and for nothing but what God has promised, without the special assistance of the Holy Spirit, do understand these things or not. The Apostle tells us that the things of God, spiritual things, knows no man but the Spirit of God, 2, 11 and 12, which are the grace, mercy, love, and kindness of the promises, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. To say that of ourselves we can perceive, understand, and comprehend these things without the special assistance of the Holy Ghost is to overthrow the whole gospel, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as has been elsewhere demonstrated. But it may be, it will be said, there is more stir than needs made in this matter. God help poor sinners if all this be required to their prayers. Certainly men may pray at a cheaper rate, and with much less trouble, or very few will continue long in that duty. For some can see no necessity of thus understanding the grace and mercy that is in the promises to prayer, and suppose that men know well enough what to pray for without it. But those who so speak neither know what it is to pray, nor it seems are willing to learn. For we are to pray in faith, Romans 10, 14. And faith respects God's promises, Hebrews 4, 1. Romans 4. If therefore we understand not what God has promised, we cannot pray at all. It is marvelous what thoughts such persons have of God and themselves who, without a due comprehension of their own wants, and without an understanding of God's promises, in which all their supplies are laid up, do say their prayers, as they call it, continually. And indeed, in the poverty, or rather misery, of divide aids of prayer, this is not the least pernicious effect or consequent, that they keep men off from searching the promises of God in which they might know what to pray for. Let the manner of prayer be so prescribed to men, as that they shall never need either to search their own hearts or God's promises about it, and his whole work is dispatched out of the way. But then is the soul prepared to write for this duty, and then only, when it understands its own condition, 
the supplies of grace provided in the promises, the suitableness of those supplies to its wants, and a means of its conveyance to us by Jesus Christ. That is all that we have by the Spirit and not otherwise. This shall be immediately declared. Thirdly, to the manner of prayer I join the end we aim at in the things we pray for, and which we direct them to. And in this also are we in ourselves at a loss. And men may lose all the benefits of their prayers by proposing undue ends to themselves and the things they pray for. Our Savior says, Ask, and you shall receive. But the Apostle James affirms of some, chapter 4, verse 3, You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your pleasures. To pray for anything and not expressly to the end in which of God it is designed is to ask amiss and to no purpose. And yet whatever confidence we may have of our own wisdom and integrity, if we are left to ourselves without the special guidance of the Spirit of God, our aims will never be suited to the will of God, the ways and means in which we may fail and do so in this kind, when not under the actual conduct of the Spirit of God. That is, when our own natural and distempered affections do emix themselves in our supplications, and these are innumerable. And there is nothing so excellent in itself, so useful to us, so acceptable to God in a manner of prayer, but it may be vitiated, corrupted, and prayer itself rendered vain by an application of it to false or mistaken ends. And what is the work of the Spirit of God to guide us in this, we shall see in its proper place.